Welcome to a fascinating edition of Rebellion's educational series. We're talking to a space family today, astronaut Mike Mullane, a legend in the space field, and his son Patrick Mullane, the executive director of Harvard Business School Online, one of the most successful families you're gonna come across the Mullanes. And by the way, the sister nominated for a Pulitzer. Wow, astronaut Mullane, congratulations on being an amazing father. Well, <laughs> I appreciate that, Alex, very much. Uh, I did have a, a wife, though, that probably contributed more to it than I did. No, you probably had the most amazing wife ever. So I, I you know, a lot of people want to see her canonized for dealing with me all my life. <laughs> so I can't imagine how uh, Ray and Hoot raised children when they were both astronauts. That seems like yeah, just that's, a, that's to a, a different story. Yeah, I uh, I was blessed to have some great kids and a uh, great wife to to help bring them along, and uh, they've succeeded admirably. Well, from, uh, the, from the polar opposite of joy, let's get to, to sheer uh, fear, because uh, that's fear. a big part of our show today. You know, being in an astronaut's family, obviously Patrick spent so much of his life afraid. Astronaut Mullane, when were you most afraid as an astronaut? Well, I flew in the early shuttle program, Alex. I was uh, uh, on the uh, 12th, the 27th, and the 36th mission, which is very early in the shuttle program, 94 through 1990. Uh, uh, Challenger occurred in 86. So I flew, to put in perspective, I flew once before Challenger and twice after. But my first launch attempt in 1984 aboard the first flight of Discovery was certainly uh, <laughs> a, a scary, scary moment. Uh, people have probably seen the launch sequence for the shuttle where the three liquid engines start six seconds early. And there's a reason we do that is they can be shut off if there's a problem. Whereas when you, launch, when you ignite those solid rocket boosters, those big white tubes on the side of the, of the gas tank, when you ignite those, there's no going back. So you want all those liquid engines checked before you uh, give that ignition command to the solid rocket boosters. And 11, my first flight was the 12th flight. 11 previous times, the three liquid engines started, passed their checks, the boosters ignited, the rocket flew. We're out there on, on my first launch attempt and watching the digits flicker off the clock, eight, seven, six, main engine start. You get this heavy vibration in the cockpit when that occurs. And I remember thinking, well, whatever happened, I was, I was, <laughs> frankly, anybody sitting on that rocket is scared. I'll tell you, you fear for your life while you're out there. And you're really dwelling, you know, you, you've thought about that a lot, about the risk you're about to take. And you get that engine shaken. And, and I remember thinking, well, whatever happens, I'm going now. Five, four, three, silence. All three engines shut off. They did not pass their checks. It was a launch abort, we call it. Uh, we had practiced that in our simulations months earlier, but it wasn't really fresh in our mind, and, and um, or it certainly wasn't fresh in my mind, but uh, it takes you by surprise. It, I think it took us all by, all by surprise, regardless of the training that we'd had on it. And uh, then, which when you're surprised on these rockets, it's fearful. And then the ground report seeing a fire at the base of the vehicle. Now, when you're sitting on 4 million pounds of propellant and somebody says there's a fire at the base of the vehicle, uh, that gets your attention. And the fear factor ramped up uh, a lot in that context. Did you just say to yourself, oh, I'm going to die now? Well, that certainly is in your mind. I mean, you're wondering, uh, you can't see what's going on there. It turned out it was a fire on on the pad right underneath the vehicle. It wasn't on the vehicle, but you know nobody really knew at that time. They just, there was the word fire. Uh, we in the cockpit thought we were gonna have to do an emergency escape, which uh, would have entailed opening up the side, ha side hatch by ourselves. There'd be, of course, nobody out there to help us running across the access arm, jumping jump in some escape baskets and release those. And those things slide down a quarter mile long wire to a, get caught by a net where we would jump out and then hide in an underground bunker. We did not have to do that. Uh, we prepared for it, but the ground told us to sit tight in the cockpit. They turned on the fire suppression system and got the fire out. And we later climbed out of the cockpit uh, the normal way. But during those moments, uh, before it was obvious what was, what was really happening, uh, you know, it's, it's fearful. It was fearful before the engine started. And now you hear, you, they start, they shut down. Somebody mentions fire. You have, you have no way of seeing what's going on back behind you uh, or down on the pad. So uh, it really, really generated you know, a, a significant fear factor in that cockpit for those moments. Patrick, were you watching this at the time? 
Yeah, so as a, as a immediate family member, you're um, escorted to the top of the roof of the uh, launch control center, which is a, you know, probably, it's probably only three floors, but it's three floors with a lot of computer equipment in it. So it's like a 10 story building uh, in, in the normal sense. And so you're standing on top of that about three miles, miles away from the launch pad. And uh, the thing that there were a, weird, a bunch of weird things that came together on that day, it was exceptionally foggy. It was very hard actually to see the launch pad from three miles away. It was a lot of haze. And so we saw the flash of the motors ignite. Uh, and then we heard there was a shutdown. And there were two things that you know, I talk a lot about this in my book that really stoked fear in me and clearly in my mother and sister's was um, first of all, uh, to the point that dad mentioned about them in the cockpit not having it fresh in their mind, it was pretty clear the launch controllers didn't have it fresh in theirs either. They sounded a little confused and their, their speech got a little more panicked is a strong word, but certainly was more rapid. And uh, as I point out, you know, it, all of us were raised with this kind of right stuff mentality of mission control, no matter what's happening you know, maintains this even keel and is cool and calm. And that wasn't coming through on the, uh, on the loudspeakers around us where we would hear the communications um, from launch control to the shuttle. And then the second thing that was, uh, was really terrifying was that we had forgotten, and you know, it's something most people don't think about, that three miles away from the launch pad, it takes uh, about 15 seconds for the sound to get to you. So we saw this flash, we heard there had been a shutdown, there was this chatter on the, on the net about, you know, uh, kind of confusion about what had happened. And uh, all of a sudden we hear what sounds like an explosion and immediately look back to the launch pad thinking, oh my gosh, you know, something, the thing blew up. But what we were hearing was the 15 second delayed sound of those main engines lighting. So fortunately that wasn't the case, but then the, then the tension ramped up again for the same reason that uh, you and my father were talking about, which is, was this fire that, you know, hearing, hearing there's a fire, um, it was really, really uh, scary. So it was, a, it was an exceptionally tense uh, half hour or so, actually a little longer than that with the fire and everything, uh, you know, watching from three miles away. And how old were you at the time? I would have been uh, uh, 13, 14, 14 years old. Is that right? Oh, yeah, I'm doing the math. Uh, so 16 years old, I'm sorry, 16 years old. Okay. Wow. I think it's uh, you know, Pat's book, uh, The Father, the Son, and the Holy Shuttle, his coming of age story, which includes coming of age as a, as a kid of an astronaut's, uh, of an astronaut, uh, is very, very revealing. I, I, I was wrapped up in my career as an astronaut, and I didn't really think about uh, the effect that my life was having on the family, particularly the children. Mm. Uh, you know, they were teenagers, they seemed immersed in their own worlds, and, and I didn't realize how significantly it was impacting them, and that, that's why I, uh, when Pat wrote his book and I read it, I thought, wow, you know, it's a whole new window into this astronaut business. Uh, you know, you got to remember, it doesn't happen in a vacuum with just you, it happens with your family, too, so it's a, it's a great book, and uh, you know, it's glad, glad to see <laughs> see some of the stories there so I can better appreciate uh, that aspect uh, of being a father. Uh, yeah, one thing, one thing too that I'd mention, you, know, you mentioned not really being conscious of it. I do think there was a part of both of us and, and of our families that weren't all that conscious of it either for two reasons. One is, you know, we had grown up uh, moving around the country, the world really, um, as the family of a military aviator. And while he was doing that, people got killed. Now, um, you know, certainly dad remembers squadron mates who got killed. And I remember when we were living at Edwards Air Force Base when a pilot there was killed. So um, you kind of had the sense that um, this aviation business could be dangerous uh, and you, you kind of learned to live with it. Um, and then secondly, once to Houston, you know, I lived in a community that was steeped in all things NASA. We, you know, the, my high school was literally a mile away from the back gate of Johnson Space Center. And roughly half, it's estimated about half of the, the kids there, their parents worked at NASA in some capacity. And a lot of those kids' parents were astronauts. So you're, you're kind of in this bubble where it, it, it was normal. I mean, this is what people did and you didn't really, you know, think a lot about it. I certainly appreciate it a lot more with the distance of time um, how unique that life was uh, relative to what most teenagers experienced. That said, and to my dad's point, you know, it's still a coming of age story. And I was going through all the typical teenage angst any teenager does anywhere in the world.
world um, when they're you know going through those awkward uh, teen years, and mine were more awkward than some. So um, it was really it was a really interesting kind of clash of uh, of the two worlds, if you will, for for me in my life. Was there a book growing up, like the right stuff that inspired you maybe to write this at all, or you know the one that you maybe modeled it after in any way? You talking about my book or my father's or both? <laughs> your book. Well, yeah, yeah. start with your book. Yeah. No, you know, it, uh, it's funny. Um, I modeled my book more on uh, an author named uh, Mary Roach, um, who wrote a, uh, has written a lot of uh, best-selling nonfiction books. So she wrote a book. Her first one was called Stiffs, the, I think it's called Stiffs, the Amazing Life of Cadavers. Um, and then another one was actually about astronauts called Packing for Mars, where she has a footnote that mentions that if anybody wants to learn what the shuttle days were like, they need to read dad's book, the Riding Rockets. Like she gives it a plug there. But um but she uh, she writes in a in a funny way, but where you learn something, and particularly the use of footnotes, which I know sounds sounds makes it sound boring, but the use of kind of little diversions to briefly explore some sort of interesting factoid that doesn't really fit in the narrative. So I do that a lot in my book. Oh. Um, you know, as an example, um, does, your, does your book cover but, Challenger? Because obviously, oh, yeah. like, you you must have been eighteen when that happened, prime time of your life. How did that yeah. impact you? Yeah, so you're right. I was 18. I was a senior in high school. Um, uh, I was in, in class, and my father and I have talked a lot about this. The thing that's interesting, again, getting back to kind of the normalcy, what we, normalcy of what we were doing, uh, it wasn't really considered a very special day. There's a lot of um, a lot made of the fact that Krista McCullough was on it, and this was critical to schools everywhere, yeah. very interesting to schools everywhere. But in my school, it was just another shuttle launch. And so I was sitting in a class, uh, frankly, having forgotten about the launch that morning, um, and then a, um, a classmate of mine, her name is Angela Portero, shows up at the, at the door and uh, hands a note to the teacher. And the teacher says I'd been summoned to the principal's office. And, and um, I, was, I stepped out. This is another case of great fear in my life. I stepped out into the hallway and it was clear she had been crying. And I asked her what was wrong and she wouldn't tell me. And so my mind, I immediately thought that dad had been killed because uh, my father was with his uh, crew for his next mission they were training out in New Mexico. And when the astronauts flew to their destinations, they flew in NASA T-38 jets, these you know, kind of tra fighter trainers. And, um, and so I worried he'd been killed while flying out there and you know, she wouldn't say anything. And turns out by the time I got to the office, what I learned was the principal had called all astronaut kids out of the class, their classes to let them know what had happened. So again, a really strange mix of emotions, huge relief to find out my father was okay but obviously devastated by what had happened. And uh, in particular, Judy Resnick, who flew with that on his first mission, who was killed on Challenger. You know, I knew uh, her as a kid. So, you know, remember times of our home when she was there. And so it hit home even more so, I think for me, just because of that age, I knew her. And frankly, as a teenage boy, she was a really pretty lady. And I, so, you know, you, you, you kind of noticed as a, as a teenager, uh, noticed her. Um, and you know she was lost on Challenger. So yeah, it was a very yes, yes. When she she gave her uh, interview to Tom Brokaw, he actually brought up how she was pretty, which obviously in today's world, yeah, would today, be yeah. from NBC and barred from uh, news. But yeah, no, he he did bring up how she was strikingly pretty. And uh, yeah, like I said, is a you know uh, one thing about both our books to that point is that they're they're very honest about you know what we were thinking and our our emotions at the time. So they're not necessarily politically correct in that regard, but. You know, they're truthful. Um, and certainly in that case, uh, it, it was, as I say in my book, it, it, I even make the comment when, in commenting about her death mm -hmm. that she was so uh, such a almost a mythical figure to me because she looked like an actress who played an astronaut, not an astronaut. And I make the point that that's sexist. It absolutely was. But to a teenage boy in the 1980s, it's, yes. it's the truth of how I viewed her. And it made the loss seem even more poignant for that reason. No, no, without a doubt. I mean, after watching a number of her interviews, I can say that she seemed to have just such a, a wonderful kind of dynamic personality, which really, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. lent. So yeah, I was uh, I was crew with her there on that first Discovery flight, and got to know her very well. And uh, she's a wonderful lady, uh, brilliant engineer, electrical engineer, uh, just a, a lot of fun. Uh, she was a feminist, like all of the six women were. Uh, we, I was selecting the first group of, of space shuttle astronauts, and that was the group that had the six women, uh, three African-Americans, uh, Asian-American. Uh, you know, it was the, the first uh, you know, class of a mix like that. And I was crewed with her. And she was a feminist, like all of them. But she also 
I don't know, she had kind of a one of the guys type of attitude too. She was very easy to work with. Uh, there were boundaries about what you could say or do. And, you know, she'd slap mm -hmm. at you. If she, not, not, you know, uh, not with, you know, physically, but certainly verbally, if she felt, uh, you know, that we, we needed it, us guys needed it. But uh, I really, really enjoyed being crewed with her. She was uh, just a wonderful person. I was in, uh, actually, as Pat said, at Challenger, I was, uh, I didn't even see it live. None of us did in my crew. We were out training at Los Alamos, New Mexico for our second mission, uh, for my second mission, that was supposed to be the first flight out of Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. Uh, that never occurred. I'm going to go into the technical reasons after Challenger, why they pulled the plug on uh, West Coast launches on the shuttle. But we were to be the first to fly from Vandenberg Air Force Base on the shuttle. And uh, we were training for a military payload, uh, part of which was being uh, assembled and uh, tested at Los Alamos Labs in New Mexico. So we were there training for this payload and we're in a secret area and there was no televisions or anything like that. So it's probably about 15 minutes after the tragedy had occurred before somebody came into the room and told us that we needed to, to get in front of a TV and call back to Houston. Uh, you know, of course we were you know, confused until they told us that the shuttle blew up. And you know, I, I just, it was so hard to understand what they were talking about until you, you sat down at the television and, and looked at it and they were replaying it, of course, on the news. Astronaut, was your confidence in NASA shaken after Challenger? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think all of it was. I, I think that uh, if you look at the ch Challenger was a failure of uh, obviously the solid rocket booster, but that solid rocket booster, the problem, uh, which I won't go into, as I say, O-rings, people might pick up on that term. The problem was well known. They saw the very first mm -hmm. uh, problem with those O-rings after the flight, second shuttle flight, four years before Challenger. And because of a basically a team failure uh, through those four years of seeing multiple times uh, the, the, the machine telegraphing, you know, telegraphing, there's a very dangerous deviance going on here, which engineers are aware of, but again, through a, because of a team failure, uh, that uh, resulted in, in Challenger and the deaths of seven, seven astronauts, including Judy Resnick. Uh, that obviously shook everybody's confidence in the, in the, in uh, in the astronaut corps and within NASA. I, I personally, and I suspect a lot of the military astronauts thought the same way, is that this vehicle is so complex that it's beyond humans to make it foolproof and that we were going to lose a shuttle. But that, that was my, I never voiced it and I don't hear anybody else, but I kind of suspect the military people who spent lives flying high performance aircraft that in spite of the incredible uh, minds that built these things, they would still have failures and crash. And the shuttle was infinitely more complex than any fighter I ever flew. So I felt like it was certainly at risk of having a, a failure. But I thought when it had it, if it had it, that it would be for just be, we couldn't know. You know, it's one of these things you built a complex machine and with all the testing and results, you just could not see or see this particular failure mode that would result in uh, a disaster, to learn that it was all predicted, you know, over these four years before Challenger, that's what was heartbreaking, to realize that there were many opportunities there to have stopped the chain of events that resulted in Challenger. That's what was, was really, truly heart heartbreaking. Uh, no, then there should have been a hard stop on temperatures above all else implemented as this protocol. I, I mean, obviously there was a, a tremendous breakdown communication and whatnot and you know there are those who blame certain higher ranking members of uh, nasa but um the data was all very obvious and it was all there and yeah it was there it was uh, like i said the, the machine was telegraphing a failure four years and 23 flights before before challenging including on my first flight by the way uh there were 12 instances of o-ring anomalies uh yeah. before before challenger and astronauts knew nothing about the o-rings uh very few people because of a communication. Really, you didn't. I, I would have assumed you guys would know everything about it. No, so. no. you got to remember wow. uh, the solid rocket boosters are, you know, uncontrollable. We have no insight into their performance in the cockpit. We can't shut them off. Uh, we don't have any insight into their performance. So there's nothing we can do with those things. So we don't spend time learning about things we have no insight to into and or control over which is the case with the solid rocket booster. We spent all of our time devoted to learning the liquid fuel system because we can have some control and insight there. 
the uh, navigation system, the computer system, the environmental control system, the orbital maneuvering system, the robot arm. All of these are things that we spent our time on because we had insight into their performance and control over them. Solid boosters, no. So we were largely ignorant of the design of those uh, of those boosters. And, and certainly I didn't know anything about the O-ring. Uh, and a lot of people did not because of a communication failure. But uh, after Challenger, when they published the, the missions that had these O-ring anomalies, uh, mine, uh, Flight 12, had a significant O-ring anomaly. And uh, <clears throat> so it was a near miss there. Uh, and of course, you didn't know about it. Uh, you know, but but still, <laughs> when you read it later on, certainly gets your attention to realize how many bullets you were dodging uh, on these flights. But everybody flew the same O-ring design for the first 25 missions, so everybody was exposed to the same same risk there. Uh, well, Patrick, let's get back to your book. What would you say are you know, the main themes that a reader will take away from it? Uh, it has a lot to do with, I think, kind of trying to find your way in the world as most kind of coming of age stories do. I, I comment that, you know, my life was shaped by some very uh, kind of clear lines around right and wrong. Another reason the title is relevant, because certainly the Catholic Church, what I was brought up in, was very clear about those things. Um, geopolitically, it was very clear, you know, the Soviet Union was bad, the United States good in that, in that kind of Cold War period. Um, it was really clear in cinema at the time. Um, I was a huge fan of Star Wars, which was, which quite frankly seemed to be an allegory for what was going on in the world, right? With respect to kind of the dark power and the, and the, and the, the force and the good on one side, uh, on the other side rather. Uh, Indiana Jones, you know, the doing, doing good. All of Steven Spielberg's and, um, and Lucas's films. I just loved all of them. And, uh, and then throw on top of that, the John Hughes films of the day. So I was kind of living those, you know, these high, these high school films about being the outcast in a high school. So all of those things really, really did a lot to shape me. Um, and then my father's profession layered on top of it, left me with maybe a little more angst than a lot of people. And that I, uh, not only did I want to find a place in the world, but I, I talk about how I just wanted to be a person of consequence. Like I saw him being, and like I saw Luke Skywalker being. Well, did you worry every day about when he came home, was he going, you know, would he die that day? No, I mean, because it, it wasn't like every day was he was doing a high risk thing, unless you count driving, <laughs> driving to uh, the Johnson Space Center. So, um, you know, it wasn't it wasn't ever present. I, I would say there was pretty regular fear because I did have uh, I was mature, but beyond my age in this sense. And it's probably because of who dad was and how honest he was about the risks that he thought he faced is I did have nervousness about every launch. Like it, um, even though I said, you know, we weren't watching Challenger, it wasn't like I didn't care. I, I, I was nervous that something bad could happen. And, you know, people, uh, people that we knew could be, be killed. That was always there, but it wasn't necessarily just, um, just about him. But when, when those fearful times came and, you know, he strapped into a rocket, how many times dad for three launches, 12, something like that. I, 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 yeah. nine times because you go through the countdown there's a problem or there's weather or whatever um those countdowns are are very very tense you know they, they take years off your life so um so those periods certainly um you know you found you, you had a lot of that a lot of that stress um but yeah get back to your question it's really the intersection of all those things it's it's trying to find a way to be a person of consequence in a world where maybe you have a high, high achieving relative and where you're um, feel lost in a sea of, you know, other high schoolers. So how did you find strength to become an individual then and really be yourself? Uh, it's a great question. And I think it goes back to my parents. I mean, I'll give them credit. Uh, one thing that dad did not do was he was very clear about, and, and he even said it to me once. I don't know if you remember this dad, but I remember him explicitly telling me, look, don't be, you know, do be your own person. Don't feel like you have to do what I did. Um, or follow my path, you know, find your own. Uh, another great example of that was I had an appointment to West Point and my dad went to West Point and he, uh, he said the same thing again at that point, you know, hey, look, um, it, West Point's not for everybody. If you want to go, great, but don't go there because I went there. I didn't go there. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, that was uh, really helpful. And then I, um, I did things like uh, and this is a big part of the book, um, I did a really unusual thing to become a person of consequence in my own right, which was I became a male cheerleader in Texas in the 80s. I might have been the only one in, the, <laughs> in all of Texas. 
Um, I took immense abuse for it uh, in a time, to your point, that was not nearly as politically correct. I mean, I, I would get harassed uh, by not just students, but sometimes indirectly by administrators at schools that we would visit um, because it was seen as, you know, completely inappropriate for a, for a guy to be a cheerleader. And, um, and uh, it is fascinating that my parents never batted an eye about that. That when I told them I was going to try out, they didn't, they didn't say, what are you nuts? They didn't, they didn't hint that they were embarrassed. Maybe they were, so they hit it well, but I was, uh, I was jealous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was, it was me and nine girls. So again, getting back to teenage boy thing, it was a pretty nice gig. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I, I well, at, at Harvard, you know, being a male cheerleader is a very big deal. I remember going to yeah. a Crimson game, maybe in 91, 92, and the male cheerleaders, they were huffing, puffing. They had their knee braces. Yeah. I mean, they looked like they were, you know, they were giving it absolutely their all. So, uh, yeah, in, in college, it was it was pretty common. It was not common in high school. Yeah, and w, w. Bush was a cheerleader at Yale, yep. right? Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. In college and I went to Notre Dame and, uh, you know, it was a, it was a varsity sport effectively. So, but, um, but in high school in, in Texas in particular, that was not a thing. I mean, boys played football. They didn't, they weren't, they weren't cheerleaders. So um, the combination of my parents kind of not being judgmental and telling me to find my own path. And then me doing something that was pretty insane that got me noticed um, really, really helped, I think, uh, boost my confidence kind of for everything that came after that. Yeah. How was that in life, by the way, going through and telling everybody your dad's an astronaut? Did that make you feel small basically every time? Was it a little bit of pride mixed a little bit of, you know, oh, no, there's, there was always, there was a lot of pride. I mean, I, it, it, oh. it wasn't something I said a lot in high school because, you know, the kid next to you would say, so what, so was mine, you know, so <laughs> it, it wasn't, it wasn't a way to, to oh. stand out. And then when I was in college, my, my college buddies always teased me about how I'd, uh, I'd use it to uh, meet college girls and, and uh, my, one of my buddies always would, if I just had a passing conversation with somebody at a party in a dorm, he would walk over immediately and said, oh, did he tell you his dad's an astronaut? He tells everybody and then walk away. <laughs> so they, they kept me humble and didn't let me, uh, didn't let me take advantage of that. Well, if you were my friend, I'd probably do the same. So. I know, I know. It's, in, uh, in, I in, their, in their defense. Yeah. But, uh, no, it's not, it's not easy growing up uh, under a, a great shadow. Um, definitely without a doubt. Um, so Let's get to uh, your book, Astronaut, uh, Malene. How do you think it contrasts to your son's book? Well, mine's not a coming of age story. Well, I, I guess it touches on that. I do talk about my youth. The yeah, you just came of age in your 30s. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I joke that uh, I don't think men grow a brain until we're about 30. <laughs> Certainly when I was a teenager, I was... Uh, I agree with you. I was an idiot until, you know, maybe... Yeah, I think I've got the last two or three years, I've you know, become not so stupid, but I, I look back on what I was doing as a, teen, as a teenager with some homemade rockets out in the deserts of New Mexico and amazed that I didn't kill myself. But um, yeah. no, uh, it's uh, it definitely is, is significantly different from Pat's. I, I Was I, Von Braun like a, a hero of yours? Astronaut? Oh, yeah. In fact, I regret that I never got to meet him uh, before he passed. Uh, uh, but yeah, I, I, I was consumed with the space race. I was, first of all, my dad was a World War II aviator who stayed in the Air Force after the war. Uh, he was direct, he would take us. We, wow, where did, your, where did your father uh, fly? I'm, I'm sorry. The, he flew in the Pacific on B-17 bombers that had been converted into reconnaissance and uh, air sea rescue uh, aircraft. Uh, wow. and, and he stayed in the, the transport uh, side of the Air Force after the war. And so he would take my brothers and I out to the uh, flight line and you know, we had to climb over these airplanes that were in the hangars. Uh, being I know up. the B-17 very, very well. I probably watched the Memphis Bell 100 times as a kid. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, it's, uh, uh, yeah, there's another other thing too, is I was growing up, uh, I was born in 1945. So in 1950s, when I was old enough to start realizing uh, the significance of these World War II movies. There are lots of World War II movies that are coming out. And you just see these heroic actions by aviators, uh, you know, acting out, uh, being fighter pilots or bomber pilots. So you'd say World War II inspired you to be an astronaut? Absolutely. Well, no, there was no astronauts then, but it inspired me that I wanted to be a fighter pilot or a bomber pilot. I wanted to be one of these heroes that you would watch on the silver screen. Uh, and That's there were a lot of them out there, too. Uh, you definitely become a hero to many, many people, Astronaut Mullane. That's something <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was telling your son before you came on that uh, since our, you know, first time we spoke, it's amazing how many people I've come across who uh, just you know, really look up to you. So uh, 
you know, congratulations on being, you know, uh, obviously a, a, an icon in space and a fantastic father. I, I don't know. Well, I'll take uh, some good news on the fatherhood. Uh, you know, I, I obviously did a few things right. I think, uh, again, my wife uh, deserves a big bunch of praise on this too. But um, yeah, I was, uh, but when Sputnik started, uh, when Sputnik was launched, and I, I was 12 years old, 1957. And I knew right then that I wanted to be an astronaut. Actually, I was interested in rocket, rockets before Sputnik was launched. I mean, I was, <laughs> I joke about this. So what did Sputnik but, actually mean for you? Just kind of confirmed it or? Just... Well, yeah, because before that, I was watching these science fiction movies. Because about... Ray Seddon actually decided she wanted to be an astronaut because of Sputnik as well. Yeah, well, that was the, the you know, it opened up the space race. Everything that followed with the Mercury program, the Gemini, it all all initiated by Sputnik. I, I, I'll tell people that if, if it wasn't for the Russians, we'd have never gotten to the moon. And the reason for that is, like as to Pat's point, it was a very dark time in the Cold War back there in 1950s, in 1957, and a very dark time, fearful. You know, we practiced air raid drills at schools, uh, the people were putting in bomb shelters, very scary time. And we had dismissed Russia as this wretchedly poor third world country that couldn't build a refrigerator, much less do anything cutting edge in space. And to be shocked, and that's the word, America was totally shocked to wake up in October 1957 with news that the Russians had put this satellite in orbit. Most people had no clue as to exactly what it was. They well, just at the knew. time, their ICBM fleet was basically, you know, non-existent. Like, you know, two weren't finished, two didn't work, two couldn't take off or something. Oh well, so, well they, we tried. We tried after after uh, Sputnik and blew up bunches of rockets before uh, Explorer One was launched in January of uh, of uh, fifty eight. Uh, but a rate the. Uh, you know, the, the fact that it shocked us and made us had this sense of, oh, my God, these people aren't these these uh, <laughs> these serfs out there on the steps of Russia. They, they really have cutting edge science and we don't. Mm. And so it was a very fearful time. And that, frankly, is why we got to the surface of the moon, because if we had launched the first satellite and they had come second, it would have been in Poham. It's all, they're always second. And there would have been no impetus to get to the moon. So we owe Russia big debt of gratitude for the, for launching that satellite before we did just to wake us up so we hey we got to be better we got to show the world that capitalism and democracy is the way to go rather than dictatorship and and communism well, you know, competition well. drives all this, this yeah, is wonderful sure. uh this has really been such a fantastic conversation you guys are just marvelous and I, I couldn't be more thankful uh astronaut patrick for having you two on today um, well thank you thank you Alex. thank you Oh, you guys are great. And uh, Patrick, I, I hope uh, you fly down uh, to Southampton one day and we'll, we'll play some tennis or go sailing. It'll be wonderful. Yeah, so. I don't do either, but I'll. I'll <laughs> <laughs> you, you, can, you can crew. Uh, you can crew on the boat. OK. OK. Um, <laughs> you just you wonderful. point and tell me what to do and I'll do it. <laughs> wonderful. Wonderful. And you can pour and crew. So, you know. OK, that's true, too. There you go. Wonderful. Anyway, thank you guys so much and uh, have a great week. Thanks, okay. Alex. Appreciate it. You too. Bye-bye.